All right. So yeah, let's get started with the questions. So I'd love to hear how you, how did your passion for motorcycles start? Okay. There it's, it's a long journey back. <laughs> so maybe I've, well, I've always, first of all, loved motorcycles, anything on two wheels. Like when I was little, I loved bicycles. I was super excited to just get off the training wheels and things like that. So I learned fairly quickly how to balance on two wheels. And then I discovered Laura Croft. She was like my idol. I loved Angelina Jolie and like, like her playing Laura Croft's, um, character because I used to play the games with my brother too and I just love that she was very independent travels the world rides motorcycles speaks different languages and so I kind of molded my life around her or wanted to when I was younger didn't really have any of the resources and then I met a boy who rides motorcycles and he also raced so he offered to teach me to ride and like he first took me on the back of a motorcycle um, on the freeway and when we just hit those speeds, I was addicted immediately. And I was like, I need to be driving and piloting this motorcycle myself. You know, as much as it is fun to be a passenger, I, I personally think it's people as passengers are a lot braver because you're trusting your life to somebody else. I, I like doing both. I don't mind being a passenger, but at the same time, I just love being in control and just doing my own thing, thing and exploring. So that was another reason why, how it's kind of jump-started. But the thing that really kick-started my passion was that boy <laughs> took me to my first MotoGP race, um, I think 2009 or 2010. Are you familiar with those races? Yes, yeah. Yes, okay. So I had no idea what they were. I, had, I didn't even know there was like a, like a, mo like a motorcycle race that, you know, considered kind of like, like F1 formula and stuff, like NASCAR and stuff. So I saw these super bikes and everything, heard the noises and the thought, wow, that this is just incredible. The whole experience and everybody at MotoGP, they were so friendly. And like, I just love the camaraderie of everybody there. And then um, I was in the paddock and was approached by one of the, you know, this really Italian guy with a very, very um, like heavy Italian accent. And he came up to me and was like, Hey, uh, would, would you like to be MotoGP girl? And I'm like, what, what is that? And he goes, would you like to be MotoGP girl? And I was like, I have no idea. And so Des, the guy that I was with, my boyfriend, he was like, um, you, he's like, you should take this opportunity. He's like, it's really cool. He's like, and then, so I turned to him and I was like, well, what do I have to do? And he goes, well, you know, basically you hold an umbrella over a MotoGP racer and you'll be on national television. And first thing I asked was, well, am I going to get paid? And they're like, no, but you're going to be a national television. And it's a really cool experience. So I said, okay, fine. And he goes, and you get to watch the entire race from the Honda Grishini garage. So I was like, well, don't you already have a MotoGP girl? Like I thought you already would have hired somebody. Cause I was like really like inquisitive when I was, I was like 19 and they're like, well, you know, Alex at the time it was for Alex DeAngelis. He's like, Alex DeAngelis, uh, Alex DeAngelis, no like his MotoGP girl, you know? So he wants beautiful MotoGP girls. So, you know, he, I'm sure he'll like you. And I was like, in my head, I was like, dang, that kind of sucks. You know, like whoever this girl is like, traveled from afar and you know but maybe they got to it who knows what happened but all I know is from what they said is that they were looking for a new one so I was like you know what screw it like I'm totally down so that day my very first time at a MotoGP race I got to be a MotoGP girl and um saw Valentino Rossi Jorge Lorenzo and I was like in awe like I was fangirling with everyone like again I didn't even know who these racers were but I can just feel their presence and their energy and their confidence and and like just watching them t like launch off from the starting line just it, everything was just very inspiring so that's how my passion started okay so it was yeah. very instant and that that's awesome to hear it was just so natural and organic almost yeah. and it ties into the second question because obviously you're a, a an adrenaline junkie because mm -hmm. you're a stunt woman so um, tell us, um, tell us, how did you get into that? And where did you learn your skills on a motorcycle? Well, again, I had a really good mentor, the guy who taught me also raced and was a coach. So he made me read books, watch YouTube videos, watch old DVDs of, you know, 
motorcycle uh techniques and and everything like that so i was really and my, me myself like personally when i i'm into some type of passion or something like that or a subject i really immerse myself in that subject so that i can be well versed i can you know get good at it you know i they call me like a it's the whole jack of all trades master and none like i i don't need to be a complete master but i want to get very good at all these different skills and one of them is for, for me i think motorcycles are the is my biggest strength though like of all of my hobbies so yeah and i typically already kind of ride it and drive it like i stole it whenever i'm on a bike or in a car i tend to <laughs> i've been like known to speed a little bit and drive a little bit crazy so it was just again like you said natural and organic for me to end up in that kind of in this kind of industry because it i've always just really liked it now i wasn't I, I did practice a lot because i started on dirt bikes which i think is really really important for anybody who wants to get really good at riding motorcycles because riding dirt i feel like uh really hones your skills and techniques in you know just being able to slip and slide and not freak out and jumping things and going on terrain that's just you know has less friction and everything like that and yeah it's just i think dirt riding is the best way to really learn how to ride okay that's awesome that's awesome advice um, oh, yeah. oh sorry i was gonna add to that too I'm sorry go ahead oh no 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 worries no worries um but also so when i was like little too i was always kind of a tomboy so i always loved anything like running jumping playing outside with the boys so again i naturally like kind of had a knack for fast fun things you know um, but that's it. <laughs> okay, awesome. No, that's great. And uh, with your job, can you tell us the wildest day you've had at work being a stunt actress? Oh my gosh, I have so many, but one that I'll always, always, always remember is my very, very first motorcycle fight scene. And I, so it was, it was my first fight scene ever in general, like, and I, I kind of have, you know, I do have background doing some martial arts. I, I'm not like a pro or anything, but I've taken like kickboxing, Muay Thai, different, different classes, just so I could kind of get used to it. But I never had to do a real fight scene um, before. And what was funny was they didn't, I when they sent me the email, I didn't, I made the mistake of not reading like the sides right away. Cause I, from what I was told, so it was, this stunt job was for another friend of mine and she couldn't make it. So she just, she was like, Hey, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to jump in and do this job for me. You know, like I trust you that you can get this job done. So I was like, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm more than happy. You know, thank you. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. So that's all she told me was that it was motorcycle stunts. And a lot of times when you get on set anyway, you never really know what to expect. You don't know what you're riding. You don't know what you're driving, the type, the condition the bike is. Sometimes like it's a really crappy car or bike that barely works and you have to just figure it out. And so when I got on set, I was on, you know, I was in the makeup chair and they were doing my makeup and they were putting tattoos on my face. And I'm like, dang, this is like serious, you know? And they're like putting tattoos all over my neck and my arm. And it was actually like a really cool look. And as they were doing that, the makeup artist was like, oh, are you excited? And I was like, yeah, I'm always excited. And they were like, yeah, like, I can't wait to see you fight. And I was like, wait, what? And then she was like, I can't wait to see your fight scene. And I was like, what fight scene i'm here for motorcycle stunts and then she's like i'm pretty sure you're the girl on the motorcycle that has a fight scene and then i was like uh are you sure and she was like hold on so they had to call the producer in and blah blah, blah to double check the producer comes in and he looks at me and goes are you mizzy yell and i'm like yes and then he goes oh yeah yeah that's sasha so i look on the the mirror they have like an inspiration look for all the characters there's a girl named sasha and she has tattoos all over her face she's like yeah you're or the producer was like yeah you're sasha so that's the girl and then he just leaves so i'm like oh crap and i was like what the heck kind of i've i've never done a fight scene and i'm I'm really terrible with like remembering choreography, you know, like I, I've taken dance classes and stuff. And I'm one of those people that takes a little bit longer to memorize the moves. I really have to practice them. So now I'm like freaking out in the chair, but I have to stay professional, right? So I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm really glad you clarified, <laughs> you know, with a makeup uh, person. They're like, 
yeah, so you are the girl with a fight scene. I was like, yeah, yeah, I guess I am. You know, I was like, so right away I was like, you know, can you ask for the stunt coordinator? Cause then I wanted to talk to him and be like, what the heck is this fight scene about? And so I, I didn't want to act like I was just stupid, you know, or I didn't know what was going on, even though it's kind of like that, you kind of, again, still have to keep composure. So I'm like freaking out inside, but I'm like, okay, let's just finish the makeup. But then when we finish, I'm going to, um, hold on a second. I'm sorry, I'm getting called. Yeah. After. So then I talked to the stunt coordinator and he's like, okay, are you good? You're good with a fight scene. Right. And I'm like, okay, can you just teach it to me? Like, I want to learn, you know, like tell me everything I need to do. So he's like, basically, okay, you gotta like you, the whole premise of the show was like, I was a crazy leader of a gang and I, I'm basically psycho, kind of like the Harley Quinn character, which is why I have tattoos on my face and stuff. And I'm supposed to be chasing the main character in a car. So me and two others are be, behind me in a bike and I'm like leading that crew. And then, you know, I have to do like wheelies. I had to like stop and do all these things. And then at the end, we block her car in with guns or whatever. And I, she comes out and then I, I fight her. And there's like a, a girl in the trunk that she kidnapped. And we're supposed to be kidnapping the girl in the trunk. So <laughs> I was like, okay, simple enough. <laughs> and by this time, by the time I had to do my fight scene, it was like two, three in the morning. So we work like sometimes really long hours. And when and somebody messes up or something goes wrong, like cameramen or anything, everything gets pushed back. But the more things get pushed back, people get very frustrated, like the producers, the cast, crew, everyone, because every, now everyone's getting grumpy, waiting. So the stress is real, like, and you feel it. So now, and by this time, it was like three o'clock. I already did like the wheelies and all that stuff, but I was really freaking about the uh, freaking out about the fright, fight scene. And so um, the, the, by, by all means, or not by all means, um, mind you, they have not even taught me the fight scene at all. So I get on set or not, that I get onto like the area where we have to fight and they're like, okay, we're going to teach you the fight in five minutes and then you have to get it done, you know? And they're like, because everybody wants to go home. This is the last scene of the day. So I could feel everyone's like, Oh God, like, let's hurry up. Let's hurry up. And I'm like, Oh God, I have like five minutes to learn this fight scene. So the main character comes out and she's freaking out too. And she was like, um, she's like, do you know what the fight scene is? And I'm like, no, I don't. I was like, how long have you been doing this? She's like, girl, she's like, I've been acting for like 20 years. And I was like, okay, that's good. She, and she was like, okay, but I, I just don't know about this fight scene. So she, it made me feel better that she was kind of freaking out too. So the stunt coordinator comes and he goes, okay, so you, she comes out of the car. You, you have to come up to her. Like, so you get off the bike, take off the helmet, shows all your tattoos, come up to her. And this girl is like towering over me. She's like, way taller with heels and everything and so she he was like you gotta punch her right away then she punches you and then you have to like uh I think like grab her shoulders and knee her and then she tries to punch you and you duck and then I like it's like a full-on choreography thing he teaches it to us in like two minutes right so he and then he goes okay got it and I was like uh we can try it and so I look at the girl I'm like did you get it? She goes, no, did you? And I was like, oh my gosh, no. And then the people were like, all right, let's just try it for the first time and let's, let's uh, get it done. We're just going to film, you know? And they're like, everyone's like screaming at each other. The producers are screaming at each other. So I'm like, okay, I'm not even going to try to say like, please give me a break or whatever. But then really quickly, I was like, hey, can I just take like a second? I just need to go to the bathroom real quick. Right. So, cause I was like freaking out that everyone was freaking out. So I, I leave for a little bit, I take a deep breath, literally like a minute or two. I was like, okay, just get yourself together. Remember as best you can. And again, if worse comes to worse, we just have to film it again. So I came out, then we did the fight scene and we got it the first time. So I don't know what happened, but in my head, I was like, you know what? Just do your best to remember everything. And it kind of just happened naturally too. So she came out, I just pretended to punch her. And she was like, before she was like, please don't hit me. And I was like, I really, I won't. But I was like, but if I do just make it, you know, it's, it'll be more real. <laughs> and then so we start fighting and the, the producers were really happy with the first shot. And they were like, that looked great. And so I was like, Hell yeah. So I was just like going along with it. And then um, after they're like, you know what, let's do one more for safety. Cause they always, even after you do a successful run, they want to do one more for safety in case like a cameraman missed an angle or whatever. So anyway, we did it again and it was great. And 
all went well. That was the last scene of the day. And yeah, so that was a great, I just remember I haven't been that freaked out in so long because again, it was like completely new territory, but because I was able to overcome that, my self-confidence grew in like immensely after that. I was like, you know what? I could do this. I could do whatever they tell me to. Cause every time I get on set, there's always some kind of new unpredictable challenge that I'm just like, okay, we're just have to go. Uh, we're just going to have to go with the flow, but I could talk forever. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. No, that's awesome. It just yeah. sounds like, yeah, you can really be thrown in the wolves and you learn and now you can just add that to your resume and go from there and do yeah. more great scenes. So no, that's, that's awesome. That's really, really, that's like inspiring for people who want to be like you or be a stunt woman. And uh, which let's, it ties into my next question with your job. Uh, you love to travel the world with your job and in your personal life. So where is your bucket list spot to go on motorcycle adventure and what bike are you riding? Oh, that's a really good question. I have always, so I've been to Italy before and I love it out there. The motorcycle community is very big, but there's specifically a place in Italy called the Stelvio Pass. I don't know if you've heard of it. No. Oh, it's, you need to Google it. It's beautiful. It's like every rider's dream. So it's a really famous twisty pass in the Alps. And there are, um, I think there are 48 hairpin turns. It's about 30 miles. So it's literally like just back and forth and, and it's beautiful. So I, I would totally, if I had to choose a bike, I'd probably want to do it on my Aprilia because it's Italian. It just seems right. And I just, I love my Aprilia RS660. It's just such a smooth bike to ride um, overall. And then if I do get tired, there's cruise control. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's one of the choices. Again, I, I really just love traveling the world and riding on two. So if it weren't like, if I had like second or third choices, I would love to be on like any like a BMW GS of some sort, maybe a, a Royal Enfield Himalayan because I've ridden a Royal Enfield Himalayan through the Himalayan mountains, ironically. And that bike is amazing. It is absolutely incredible. It like went through dirt, rocks, rivers, anything you could possibly imagine. It even went through the highest motorable pass, which is 18,000 feet and you need oxygen to ride up there. And the bike had no problems at all. So I was like, I never knew about Royal Enfields really until I rode it and was like very impressed, surprisingly impressed with it. But I would like to ride in New, like New Zealand, Portugal, uh, Tibet, any anywhere around there. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, anywhere is on the anywhere, list. Yeah, honestly, as long as I get to explore anything, rainforest, anything like adventure, I'm I'm always down for. I love that. That's awesome. And yeah, I totally feel that as well. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about your goal of breaking the current land speed record on a turbocharged streamliner motorcycle. What stemmed this ambition for you? Oh, that's funny. Where did you even find that one? That was years ago, girl. So that was in 2011, 2012, 13. It's a, around that period of time. And honestly, I just got the opportunity by this very sweet man named Kenny Lyon. So he randomly found me, I think it was on Facebook or I, some type of social media. And he was like, hey, would you want to race this haunt, like streamliner, blah, blah, blah. You know, I hear you're a good rider, this and that. Would you want to set a land speed record? And I'm like, hell yeah why not like if I could go fast on a cool bike hell yeah so I, I would not say no to that so we actually went for two years straight um to Bonneville Salt Flats and I did end up setting two land speed records but uh, I'll talk about that after so I went for two years in a row but every time that we went something happened so I don't know if you remember but the Bonneville salt flats were became flooded like completely flooded for one year and the last time it flooded I think was like 20 years before that so it was literally an anomaly thing like where people were like all these people from around the world came to race their their machines out there and we basically all I don't want to say we wasted our time but it, it got flooded out to the point where it, it was actually such a cool and unforgettable experience anyway, because a lot of people went home because they were so like upset and bummed out that they couldn't race. But for the, you know, ones who have the silver lining, we're like, you know, what, let's stay and have an adventure. So we stayed and it literally looked like a mirrorless, a mil, uh, mirrorless lake, you know, so 
because it's such it's so flat out there and it's like salt and everything when it gets flooded it it looks incredible it's like a lake that and it just completely mirrors everything so we camped out there for like 12 days anyway and we just had a lot of fun um and then we went home so that was the first year that I went and the second year we were all ready to go I had my fire suit I was ready this thing had three parachutes ready because it you know I was trying to break 200 miles per hour in this like Honda Goldwing streamliner and it was like turbo or supercharged and so in order to stop it you need to deploy parachutes so I'm like so stoked to be able to ride this thing and we didn't pass tech because like he's done this for years but it just again happened that a month prior to that there was a man who passed away because his roll cage wasn't thick enough so the rule before was that the requirements were half an inch thick for the roll cage so ours was half an inch and so ours totally passed but then when he he passed away they changed the rule to three quarters of an inch so when we went to tech, they're like, oh, we can't, we can't, you can't ride this because it doesn't pass tech. It needs to be three quarters. And we're like, that kind of sucks because we paid for registration and everything. Like no one let us know, you know, um, beforehand. And they're like, well, we kind of had to change the rules now and that it just is the rules. It's not safe. So, you know, of course we can't argue with that, but again, we weren't able to race that. So I had to, so I raced uh, this other one. It was like uh, another Honda Goldwing with a sidecar so i set land speed records on that um and that was cool but again i really wanted to ride the streamliner but we didn't get to well there's still time there's still time before. yeah but that was 12 years ago and then after that i just got very very busy with everything so so with that do you have any plans on drag racing full-time or any sort of racing um of course. Well, I did get my, my race license. So for the track, I, it does take a lot of time and commitment, honestly, which I, I wanted to get it just so that I can have it. And so that like, whenever I have the time, I'm like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to join in a couple races or so. But as far as drag racing goes, I don't have any solid plans for that yet, but I am the type of person that when like a badass opportunity comes my way, especially involving adrenaline travel and or speed, then yeah, I'll more than often uh, like take it um, or I'll more often than not take it. So. Okay. So we'll just keep our eyes sealed then. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody out there wants me to race any of their bikes, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what's, been your favorite motorcycle you've stunted with and why okay let's see i would i would have to say hands down my supermoto so i have a little crf 150r big wheel and it's just supermotors are my favorite type of bikes because you can take them on and off uh asphalt so you can just go if you want to go on trails and stuff you can kind of go exploring like i really love the idea of versatility so a supermoto and mine specifically is, is really fun. They're really nimble and you could just toss them around. You could, you could stunt them pretty easily, you know, but it is a bit sketchy doing wheelies on mine because it's, it's very torquey and it's also very light. So it's really easy to loop it. So I've had even like other pros with stunting, they've looped that bike and they're just scared to touch it and they call it the death trap. But I'm like, no, you know what that means? I'm gonna try to get good at it so that I like, you know, if I could ride that, then I can wheelie a bunch of other things, right? Like my goal is to be able to wheelie any, like not even just wheelie, but like stunt any bike that they put you on, any type of like vehicle. Because again, in the stunt industry, you need to be well-versed. You're not just going to have a, when you get on set, they're not going to have a bike that's set up for stunts, you know, with a bigger sprocket or a rear um, brake on the handlebars or anything like that, you know, like you have to be able to use the rear clutch. I'm sorry, the, the rear brake, the rear clutch. That's a new part, guys. <laughs> the, rear, the rear brake um, when you're wheeling and you just have to like just be able to stunt even the crappiest of bikes. So for me, I, I like to put myself in challenges. But again, my supermoto is my favorite uh, bike to stunt right now. Okay, that's awesome. And awesome advice too. So what's some more advice you would or could give someone who is interested in becoming a stunt motorcycle actor? Um, 
just like with any type of skill, practice, 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 getting seat time, getting comfortable um, with the bike or car. And it really just depends on what, are you asking for the stunt motorcycle, like acting in general or yes. specifically? Yes. Okay. So yeah, um, I, I would also say like, just get to know the industry because the stunt industry and I'm still learning every day, meeting all these different people. It's, it is a very, very different world. And, you know, it's Hollywood in general, in general could be very harsh. So you just have to really grow tough skin, be as, you know, be likable, be genuine because genuinity really comes a long way when it comes to that. And um, just getting to know people and networking and not being afraid to ask questions and not being afraid to, to like take control of a situation when you have to. So, but that's basically it. <laughs> I, mean, I love that advice. It's very true. And not a lot of people would really expect someone in Hollywood to say, oh, be genuine because you think the, you think all oh, you're so fake, right? <laughs> I mean, you can go both ways, but I feel like people, there is a whole fake it till you make it thing. Cause there are some people who are just so nervous that they're like, oh, I'm just going to fake it. But which I, in a sense, I could, I will agree with that part. Like, because sometimes you, if you don't have that confidence, you can just be like, pretend to be someone else, pretend like you're a confident person. In that sense, I think people can see through fakeness for the most part. Um, and they, people can really feel genuinity too. So many times, like when I've talked to people, they're like, you know what, I, I feel your energy and your vibes. Like, it's such an LA thing to be like, oh, I feel your vibes, but it's true. Like, I don't know how else to say it because I'm very energy sensitive too. So when I talk to people, I can tell that, hey, you're hiding something or there's, there's something about you that maybe you're just, it's like an insecurity. It could be something, you just have your walls up or whatever. So for me, I'm like, okay, just try to stay as genuine as possible. And that's like, the advice I always give other people. No, that's really good. I appreciate that advice for sure. And I think a lot of other people would love to hear that um, <laughs> to even help themselves on a personal level. Right, just in life in general, not just in the stunt industry. Exactly. Um, so with that, what are your tips on keeping calm and collected while stunting in front of cameras and people? <laughs> okay, so, well, I would say that, you know, if you get so good at something, it becomes second nature and you won't really get as nervous because you would have built up that self-confidence thing. But again, if if you don't have if those skills yet, even like just sometimes you, uh, how can I explain this? Um, you just be able to go with the flow. Because remember the, the story that I told you about, like my fight fighting scene or whatever you know I was really nervous I was like oh my gosh all these people are counting on you you know all these cameras are on you so I, sometimes if you just have to take a step away to take a breath like a little breather a quick breather I mean then I think that's also very necessary because you can't perform when your thoughts aren't you're not focused right you want to be focused and calm and collected so you just and and then just be able to go with the flow and like be open to that because a lot of people are afraid of change so when something's different like and they change something up on set like they're like oh my gosh this isn't what I was told to do but it's like no anything goes here so just be very open-minded and I also uh, like honestly put myself purposely put myself in stressful situations and environments so like for example I'll jump out of planes myself like I got my skydiving license I do scarier stuff so that it just becomes a norm so when some, something gets thrown my way I don't know if that makes sense like if something gets thrown my way that's challenging or scary I'm like I could jump out of planes by myself land my parachute by myself I can like you know I've jumped off like mount little mountains in uh, like rails and boxes on while snowboarding and stuff like that. So I'll purposely do other extreme sport things so that I could just not be afraid to be flying through the air or, you know, do whatever they ask me on set. Right. And also just when it comes to the camera in front of camera thing, I, I like do a lot of stories. I don't know if you people who've seen my social media know that I'm always on stories doing things and posting things. So that's in reality, that's me just practicing being in front of camera. That's me practicing like having a good on camera presence. 
And I think that also goes a long way just, and people don't think about that. They're just like, oh my gosh, all these people on social media are so narcissistic. No, but it's also, you know, like there's a lot of reasons why people are in social media. You know, you share your life, you want to inspire people, but it could also be practice for people like me, who's trying to, who is constantly in front of the camera. Cause I still get nervous a lot of times when I feel that there's a camera on me. So I'm just like, oh, okay, just get used to it. Just shake it off. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I think that's it for now. <laughs> no, that's really good. That's, um, yeah, interesting perspective too with the social media saying use it to practice. Mm -hmm. I have never heard that perspective, but it totally makes sense. And it's obviously working for you. And yeah, no, that's great. I really like that. <laughs> so what motivates you the most to continue inspiring riders, especially women to ride a motorcycle? Oh, I, I just love teaching and I love it for me, uh, that I'm really like fulfilled or I feel fulfilled when I help others. And I feel like I'm in, inspiring others. Cause then it gives you kind of like a purpose in life, you know, like we are always struggling to find our purpose and what we're here to do. So while I still don't fully understand what mine is, I know that like, I still feel um, very grateful and happy when I'm, when I'm helping others. And that's why I do share a lot of things that I do on social media. And um, I'm also just a really big advocate of female writers and just being able to embrace femininity while also being a badass, you know, like I've faced so many, many challenges throughout the years since I started writing because it is a male dominated industry we females in it uh, females alone have a completely different set of challenges to overcome because it's a confidence thing like because it's a male dominated industry we kind of feel like intimidated like oh this bike is big it's heavy it's this and that so and i've gone through all of that already and i've gone through a lot of belittling a lot of condescending remarks a lot of mansplaining all that you know guys thinking that i've they're like oh like i'll pull up to a bike event and they're like oh, whose back of the bike did you ride on? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'll let you know. You want to try riding on the back of my bike? You know, I'll just say some stupid stuff like that. But like, again, um, I've just been judged a lot over the years, so many times um, over the years, including now, even till this day, no matter how hard, you know, like I really worked hard to gain the respect that I do have, but people who don't know me or people still will have their opinions. You know, they've made fun of me because I have like long, like I have like long nails and stuff. And then I dress girly and, and I like to, you know, wear bikinis and stuff like that and, and show it on my social media. And people will be like, oh, she's just doing it for attention. You know, she's no, how about like, I just really embrace my femininity, like growing up my mom made it because I was such a tomboy. My mom hated when I called myself a tomboy. She's like, no, I had a boy, which is your brother for a reason. And I had a girl for a reason. She's like, I need you to remember, like you need to stay feminine, stay classy, always remember that you're like a princess. And so she would take me out on shopping trips just so that she, and she's like, I'll buy you all the dresses you want. Just, you know, just make sure you, you like, like dressing up. So she really instilled that in me. And it really did stick with me. Like we used to get our nails done together. So I really appreciate that. And I think it's completely okay for a girl to feel beautiful and sexy and, and also play with the boys and do whatever they need to do. And, and even it, you'll be surprised, even some, a lot of females aren't supportive of that. Like they'll talk crap about other girls. And I've had so many where I was shocked. I'm like, dude, I thought you were my friend. I thought we were all cool. And then you find out later, like, no, they're like just either jealous or whatever. And it's, it sucks. So for me, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to let that stop me. I really don't care what others think of me because I know like what my, like I know what my intentions are. And I know that if I just keep putting out good positivity out there, then it'll always come back. And so far it, it really has. I've had a lot more positive feedback than negative, even though the negativity will surface. And that's another thing in the stunt industry and in social media in general that I wanna give like advice to is you're gonna, if you're doing something right and well, you're gonna have haters no matter what. And it's 
I've seen a lot of people who are in the same industry as me, like just completely break down mentally and they just can't handle the stress of that. But again, you really need to grow that tough skin and know like, hey, a lot of this isn't even personal. A lot of the people who say negative things, it's a projection on their own lives, whether or not they're, you know, they're not happy with theirs. And so I really don't take things personally at all and anymore because it took me a long time to just grow and realize that. And once you do, it's so, you feel a lot more free. Like you're just like happy and free and like not just continuing to stay in your own lane and and like kicking ass doing it, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> I know, I love that. I love that explanation. I think a lot of people can resonate with that and just take it, take it to fulfill themselves and to be a better person and just continue with that positivity, like you said. And I think that's a really, really great, great way to just take life in general.